here we are, friends. We are live, 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 live. Who am I today? Today, I am Laura Maylindo. I am the member of Provincial Parliament for Kitchener Centre, and I am a mommy of three who is monitoring the sounds of learning outside of the locked door that you cannot see because I don't know about you, friends, but I've got three kids that are on line right now. Um, one is in grade one. They just logged into their class because they just yelled that to me. So they're in. I don't, does that happen at your houses? Like I get a, I'm in mom. And I get a, there's no one here. Like they're in empty rooms because the teachers are smart. Like they're not going to open up the rooms until it's time. Right. Anyway, sorry. I'm just off. I'm already in a tangent. We haven't even started. You don't even know who's with me today, but don't worry about it. It's all good. Okay. I'm still Laura May, clearly losing her mind because it's been two weeks of virtual learning and it's really hard. Um, but I'm trying really hard to be a professional and I'm just sort of talking right now because that's what we do at the very beginning of this, our philosophical podcast called dun, 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 People in My Hood. These are the people in my neighborhood. Yes, it is based off that. In my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Sing along. In my neighborhood. Well, please. <laughs> Nobody's going to sing. I'm, I'm going to finish. scare people. <laughs> <laughs> These are the people in my neighborhood. I'm not going to. I'm like literally going to finish it. They're the people that we meet when we're walking down the street. They're the people that we meet each day. Okay. So Zara, who's on my team, is like in the background going, uh, Lindo, what is happening? Yeah, but that's okay. This is what we're doing. I'm going to be a professional. It's starting right now. <sighs> Hello, everyone. My name is Laura May Lindo. I am the MPP for Kitchener Center, Mama of Three. And welcome, welcome, welcome to those that are watching live and to those that are going to watch it after um, to People in My Hood, a philosophical podcast which is kind of interesting because today what I've asked um, in the among the people in my hood, folks that I have met in a variety of capacities and some that I'm just meeting, um, is gathered some parents, parent voices, as we all wait for, and I wrote this down, um, the return to school-ish. Because we don't know what's going to happen on Monday, given the history of what has happened to us as parents over the course of the last few weeks, years, et cetera. Um, but we are hearing that we are going back to school on Monday, and we have some pretty big decisions to make about whether or not um, we will be sending our children to school, whether we have the privilege of being able to choose otherwise, uh, what that means for us in our homes. And yesterday I did a special edition of um, People in My Hood talking to educational leaders about just that. Uh, how ready are we for the return of students and staff and education workers? Um, and when I say education workers, I'm thinking broad, like, We've got bus drivers that will be back on Monday. We've got custodians that have been in there. Actually, while we think the schools are closed, they are not closed. Um, there are still students that are at the schools. Um, some students with disabilities still have to be at school and some of the EAs are in those classrooms. Um, and some people had to put the pressure on uh, to make sure that they had the proper protective equipment to be able to be in the school with our most vulnerable students. Um, and they did, so thank you for that pressure because y'all got what you needed. For the most part, some people got what they needed. I'm like, anyway. Um, but the, the idea of not having a government that understands what you need to be safe in the school um, was uh, top of mind for me. So I called some folks together. That was yesterday and you can find that on social for sure. Um, today, however, I decided it's time to get the parents to speak about what is happening and how they're feeling. Um, and I waited until today's podcast because um, we have seen in the past that the government makes announcements at the last minute. And so I thought Friday was the closest thing I would get to Monday to know what might be happening, which is why it's ish. But before I introduce you to uh, the parents in my neighborhood, um, I would like us to all start well. And what does that mean? That means by acknowledging that I, Laura May, am hosting this uh, podcast, this philosophical podcast uh, in my home in Kitchener. This land has been held down, cared for, loved, and stewarded by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral people. 
Um, I have been taught that finding out the land that you are on is the easy part. So we are on the Haldeman Tract, for instance. You can Google to learn more about that. But the real work comes um, in this fashion by making a concrete connection between the conversation that you're about to have and the reality that you're having that conversation on stolen land. And so the conversation that we're about to have is, a, is literally about safety in our schools. Um, but I would be remiss to have that conversation without acknowledging how many years residential schools were operating where students were not safe, where Indigenous communities were not safe. And we just allowed that to happen. It just happened. Um, and then when we realized how horrifying it was, we tried to pretend like it didn't happen. And if it was not for Indigenous leaders, community members, um, saying that this was not a part of our history that we could ever, ever, ever forget. Um, we find ourselves now in 2022 grappling with the reality of that history and trying to find ways um, to do the right thing, take steps towards reconciliation, take steps towards actual action to repair that harm. Um, and so as we speak about safety and security in the school, uh, come Monday, I want us to also recognize that there are layers of safety that we might be missing in this conversation if we don't take seriously uh, what happens to Black, Brown, and Indigenous students in our school system uh, with or without a pandemic. So on that happy note, sorry, it's hard to have these difficult conversations without getting real, real fast, but here we are. Um, now I'm going to switch it over to speak to some of these parents um, that are in my little neighborhood. So for those that have been following this, this podcast, the way that I do it is pretty simple. Um, I start off with a general question. And the general question for the parents today is this. Um, what? Tell me a little bit first about yourself. Um, tell me about who you are and who it is that you're thinking about come Monday, and what is the gap? How would you describe this gap within the education system right now that's making you worried about the safety? What is it that you're hearing, seeing, feeling, et cetera? Um, and I'm going to randomly start with Nicole. Hello, hello everyone. First of all, I commend everyone for being at home with their little ones or older ones doing online learning. Um, I've been very fortunate and I have a mom that recently retired who is now triple vaxxed who, although I still am very nervous about her helping uh, my five-year-old son, um, he's there currently doing online learning. I also have a three-year-old son who's in um, a licensed daycare center. Um, so definitely kind of seeing how each sort of system works around like COVID and what their safety protocols are and also what the government is sort of how they're moving forward around safety in the school system and in the um, daycare system because I do feel like yeah. the daycare system has sort of been left out because they don't have those strong unions where a lot of people aren't speaking up as much about it so I kind of come from both perspectives of just from my experience from having both of my sons in each um, sort of setting. Um, I work as a social worker, so I'm not able to work from home and sit by my, my five-year-old, um, just given the nature of my work. Um, and my um, spouse uh, last year sat and did online learning um, with my um, five-year-old, but this time around is just way too busy and just didn't feel like it would be um, a good sort of situation for both of them. So um, mm -hmm. we've decided to send them to grandma's. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where we're at right now. We've been very fortunate that we did get my five-year-old vaccinated, was able to get the, the extra boosters. Um, so I do feel a little bit better, at least that my five-year-old's boosted, but not my three-year-old. So I am, yeah. I am worried about that. And I do definitely feel... Um, that kids should be at school. Like I've seen a huge improvement, even my three-year-old, just from going back to daycare after being off. We did keep him off for two weeks over the holidays. Um, such a huge improvement and just less of the kids fighting and they just seem so much more happier, at least right now, just being out of the home environment, even in our current situation. 
Um, I do really feel like I did, um, so I did this, I'm not, by no way am I an expert on trauma, um, but I did do um, a workshop, like a brief workshop this, this week on um, the neuroscience of trauma. And just mm -hmm. one of the things I did just wanna read to you, which I think is really important to kind of note sort of moving forward is um, this is by uh, Bruce Perry, but it was in the workshop. It says, the human brain is not designed for the modern world. For thousands of generations, we lived in multi-generational, multi-family groups with dramatically higher ratio of caregiver to young child, roughly four to one. And now it's about one to four. So just even thinking about our current system within the education system, and then now looking at the online system and then us trying to grapple with like being at home with our kids, like I, it's just not possible like long-term. And so we need to figure out how we better work within the systems and the systems need to improve accordingly. And I also think about all those little kids or kids who kind of come from families that could kind of struggle with their own stresses and their own mental health and how that impacts the whole family as parents and as children and how important schools are and how important it is for them to be safe. Um, and for me, I think my big thing to, like for this podcast is that I think that both childhood educators, like early childhood educators mm -hmm. and teachers need to be considered as essential workers. So I absolutely support healthcare um, like the current healthcare is, a, they're considered essential workers and some of the other sort of outlying healthcare workers, PSWs, long-term cares. But I do feel like if we want kids to be in school and um, they we want them to um, be the last to close and the first to reopen, then they need to be considered accordingly. So for sure the ECEs right now are like, or the childhood educators all, are all considered essential workers. They stayed open this whole time with yep. unvaccinated kids without masks and they're low paying and there's huge issues around staffing as it is. Like, and it's just, it's just awful that they just haven't been considered essential workers, like both, both teachers and um, childhood educators. Thank you so much for that, Nicole. Um, before I throw it over to you, Jen, um, I think it's really important for us to reiterate um, the the idea of the daycare centers like for Nicole the way that you've spoken about it it's part of your everyday right like you're dealing with daycare you're dealing with um with kindergarten and grade one etc elementary school um but for a lot of people that make policies so people like me that are um members of provincial parliament and are elected to represent you if we don't understand the ecosystem around education then when we make policy decisions about what's going to happen, especially emergency policy decisions, we leave people out. So it was a fight and a push and a battle um, to get the government to pay attention to what was happening in daycares or even the need for daycare. Like in order to keep the, the hospitals going, we had to make sure that there were daycare spaces yeah. so that, you know, mm -hmm. frontline workers. I was just saying yesterday as well, um, I think that there was like a bit of shock from the government, it's what it felt like to me, but shock from the government when they realized that if teachers were teaching from home, they were also sending their kids to virtual school. And they were like, what? Teachers have kids? Like, that's what it felt like, which reminds me of my son who is six and often thinks that his teachers live in the school. And I was like, I think that my government needs to know more than my six-year-old son. I'm just saying. So with that, um, I hand it over to you, Jen. Talk, talk to us. Tell me um, who you are, what's going on, how you're feeling, um, what the gap is that you're seeing and experiencing on your end. Yeah, thanks. And hi, Laura, Laura May, and uh, thanks for your comments, Nicole. Um, I'm, I'm Jen Baltzer, and uh, I'm a mom in in Laura May's hood. Uh, I'm a mom of two at a very different stage than, than Nicole. Um, my kids are 12 and 14, so they are in middle school and high school. Um, and my, my oldest is now would not be considered fully vaccinated any longer. She has um, had her two vaccines, but um, as of, I guess, December, she's passed that six month point, uh, which who, who knows what that means, but I think it, it reflects the majority of vaccinated high school students that 
they're all at a point that they're no longer fully vaccinated, particularly against this particular variant. So we have a whole lot of students coming back together in a very, um, I'd say from the perspective of the schools, the high schools are the least controlled in terms of yeah. um, cohorting in any way. I, I, you know, hearing hearing from my daughter, uh, certainly it does not sound as though there's any any meaningful cohorting that happens. And I think the idea is to open that up even even further. Um, so, you know, in in her school, we've got 1,500 kids. So if if we think about the announcement that was made by the provincial government, where we aren't going to hear if there's illness in the school until there's, you know, 30% of the population is sick. This means at least 500 students and staff being sick before we as parents even hear about it. And so yep. that feels pretty scary to, uh, you know, myself and I think probably all parents sending our kids back to that kind of situation where we have our, where we're being given no information about how safe it is for our kids to be in schools yep. um and and i you know arguably the the safety measures that could have been put in place simply simply have not been put in place you know there's maybe n95 masks for the teachers um it's unclear some of the things i'm seeing on social media suggest that that's not what they're receiving um and certainly not for the kids and so you know despite the fact that that's the level of protection that's recommended from a masking perspective that's not what most people will be will will have um the government could have easily you know we we receive messages about the mandatory vaccinations that our kids need to have to be in school yeah you know this vaccine is safe it's effective we know it works and yet you know, we do not have to have these populations, you know, these school populations fully vaccinated. And so there are all kinds of levels, places where the government could have been putting safety measures in to make all of us feel like, you know, have confidence in sending our kids back to the learning environment that we all want to have our kids in. Yeah. I don't think there's any parent who wants to have their kids home working off of a computer while they're trying to work in their home office. You know, that's or, or, or where they're tr having to go out into the workplace. You know, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's an impossible situation for all of us. It's not sustainable uh, and it's not good for kids, but, but the uncertainty and, you know, I guess fear associated with sending our kids back to all of these unknowns. And, and I mean, I, I don't think it's unknown. You know, if you listen to the epidemiologists who are the experts on this, it's very clear what the outcome of reopening schools on Monday will be in the midst of yeah. this you know, the worst of the pandemic that we have seen so far. So we're sending our kids back basically to certain infection. And from the perspective of, you know, all of us having worked so hard to try to, you know, um, do what we were supposed to do, you know, stay, you know, stay in our small groups, not, you know, try to keep ourselves, our families and, and society at large safer. And then to just be told, okay, well, that's that's all down the drain. We're going to reopen everything. We're going to just let the floodgates floodgates open and see what happens. That that doesn't seem like an acceptable approach. Yeah. So I guess that's where I, you know, that's that's where I'm coming from. Um, I'm worried about, you know, I'm worried about my own kids and the kids in the school. I'm also concerned about the teachers who are being put into this situation where. Um, you know, they don't have an option as to what they what they get to do. And they they also, as you mentioned, they have their own families at home that they're concerned about their own, you know, dependents, maybe elderly family members. Um, you know, there's everyone has their own situation that makes this pandemic challenging. And yeah. none of that is being recognized in the decisions about safety that are being um, made with respect to schools right now. Thank you so much for that, Jen. Um, there are a couple things. Like I also have a middle school child and a high school child. Um, and I've had questions coming to me into the office about what what is fully vaxxed today? Like, what is it now? Because it used to be two. Um, like, I'm worried about sending my youngest because he only has one and he doesn't have his second appointment until later this month. And so... Like he won't be fully vaxxed, but then you're hearing that the booster is what now makes you fully vaxxed, which was part of why we all had to download new um, QR codes or whatever. So 
then doesn't that pretty much mean that in middle and high schools that the the majority of the kids, even if they were fully vaxxed before, are not fully vaxxed now because we've not talked about boosters for those those age groups. And we know that there's um, less uptake for uh, grade seven, eight. I was reading that in some reports uh, as well, that that group doesn't have um, as many kids vaccinated. Um, so there's all sorts of questions just around what are we even talking about when we say fully vaxxed? Like, could we? And I just read something this morning um, on Twitter because that's where I go to see if the government is going to change their mind about stuff. Um, I read this morning that they were opening it up to fourth shot somewhere. And so I was like, what is happening? And and where is the clarity? And where is the leadership to ensure that people can feel confident in their decisions? Um, the other thing I just wanted to say before I throw it over to you, Andrew, um, was to your point, Jen, we heard from in the special edition of this podcast from the educational leaders that cohorting in high school, it's not even really possible because of how high schools function here, which again, goes back to my opening um, comments and concerns that we don't have um, leadership that understands how the system actually operates. And so as they make decisions, they don't real they don't seem to realize or care to speak to anybody who could tell them um, about what a high school, like a day in the life of a high schooler would look like. They, they would never be in the same class for the entire day to begin with. So this notion of of cohorting should have already been thought through differently for that age group if you actually wanted to maintain these cohorts. But I'm with you. It sounds like they're just going to open it up kind of free for all. And I have to say, last thing, I promise, Andrew, I'll let you talk. Um, but the bef well before the pandemic, we were complaining about um, the big, huge class sizes. Like there are high school mm -hmm. classes um, and middle school classes and elementary classes that are like 30 kids, close to 40 kids already. So now what happens when somebody is sick or and then they don't want to report it? Oh, we'll talk about the not reporting in a minute. But um, yeah, I also have questions that just put me into a rant. I will end rant, be a professional and hand it over to Andrew. Andrew, sure. how are you feeling? Talk to us. Yeah, well, <laughs> crushing anxiety. Is that the right answer? <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. no, but I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, it is the whole gambit of emotions, right? Um, I guess to take a step back, who am I? Uh, I'm, I'm a professional engineer. I'm a certified energy manager and, uh, I've, I've hung up my hat on most of those most days because I'm also a dad to two boys and, uh, and my spouse is, uh, an education worker in the front lines in a classroom. So, you know, I've, I've got to be the dad at home, uh, and play that role, um, you know, and, and to which I'm, I'm very happy to do that. But, you know, nobody's ever going to mistake me for a, a homemaker. That's that's clearly not my my skill set, unfortunately. But um, my primary concern right now is is, you know, and this is tapping into that whole engineering mentality of, of sort of risk assessments. And, and that's kind of twofold. I, I feel like one of the major gaps right now is that the engineering um, especially from the ventilation side of it, because that's, uh, you know, ventilation, occupational health are some of my, my uh, core expertise and experience uh, within the domain of engineering. But also, I'm not seeing any evidence that being used um, to protect children, to protect oh. education workers, and, and or even for that matter, uh, healthcare. Um, and so when I kind of don't see that being done by others, that sort of forces me in the situation to kind of do it myself. Uh, something of a type A personality doesn't help with that. Um, but in particular, I look at my family and, and with two young elementary uh, aged kids in WRDSB, um, one of which has had two vaccine, uh, vaccines uh, recently enough. We're not in that uh, six month booster question period yet. Um, but the other one is stuck into this category of he's in junior kindergarten uh, mm -hmm. in a classroom with 30 kids. And then when you start to add in all of the other um, uh, ECEs and, and uh um, uh, the, the various other support staff that are coming in and out of that space. I mean, all of a sudden that number starts to grow to 40, maybe more people when you consider sometimes teachers aren't there and you're bringing in supply teachers to cover and so on. Um, and, and I look at, at, at his risk, uh, as a born in 2017 in JK with no vaccine as a protection. And that's just, that's absolutely terrifying. Um, yeah. Because, you know, long term, I think that, you know, we're in this, this very bizarre moment in time where 
what we are bearing witness to is potentially uh, the start of, of uh, a great period of disabling for, uh, you know, be that thousands, tens of thousands of people in our local community. You start to expand that out to the greater, you know, province, the country, the world. Um, and, and these are huge problems. Um, and, and I think that what we're also starting to really get into realizing as we uh, start to investigate, well, what is COVID? What can and should we be doing about it? We look at the ventilation side of that, um, you know, to which I, I'd argue that, yes, we've put some investment in place and we've made certain improvements. However, most of those investments, improvements based on the limited information I have, um, it, at least as what's been done in our institutions, um, is, are things that we needed to do anyway, just to catch up yeah. on the things we didn't do previously. We haven't even begun um, this journey of what we should be doing in COVID times. And then I think we take one step more. Um, and I'd, I'd even suggest that this whole conversation on indoor air quality, I mean, what we're talking about here is entirely possibly going to be the new asbestos. You know, we see that quality air in spaces that we're all occupying for most of our lives, be that at home, at work, or in this case, schools, um, is something that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's special and precious because, you know, there's only a few cells layers thick between, you know, the air that comes into our lungs and the blood that we circulate through all of our body. Um, so as a result, we have this huge impact of, you know, if you have good, high quality uh, ventilation in these spaces, not only are we preventing COVID, but we're also preventing flus and other seasonal, uh, you know, uh, illnesses and so on. But even more than that, all of a sudden we start to reduce carbon dioxide in those spaces. Children aren't as sleepy. They're more productive. You have higher educational outcomes. And, uh, and then to, to sort of look at, um, you know, some communities have been able to jump into that and throw community dollars at it and say, we're, we're doing our DIY air filters and we're going to do that. But that's only possible in some affluent communities. And we're completely missing out on sort of that, that, uh, um, that equity and justice discussion because that needs to be true for everyone. Education is not only important, but I mean, it's essential. You know, and, and when I'm when I'm old uh, and, and, and in need of, of long term care in my later years, it's going to be the children today that we've abused uh, through education. Maybe they're going to be suffering from long term disabling, uh, long COVID injuries and, and so on. But they're not going to be in charge of my well-being, you know, when I'm in that stage. And I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in this moment where I worry about those sort of future conversations, both inside of my family, you know, with my children, um, you know, and I want to be able to confidently say at the end of this, uh, when it's all said and done that, you know, I've done everything I possibly can to provide you a safe and healthy place to grow up, to learn, to become educated and become these wonderful human beings that you're going to become. And if I can't honestly say that, I don't know how I'd live with myself in that moment if something bad had happened, be that to my own children or anybody else in our community, you know, and that's just, you know, to get to that comment of disabling, crushing anxiety. Now I'd, I'll admit that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably dealing with things matter better than many um, because I do have a lot of support, you know, family of retired educators has gone an awful long way to kind of helping bridge the gaps uh, in my world, but that's, that's my luxury. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's something that, you know, these are very real questions we're going to have to have answers for, and it might not be, you know, today we can't say that there's going to be 100 students we're going to have, uh, who are going to experience permanent disabling injuries as a result of this. Maybe it's one, but I, I think that's where I think the, the, um, the lack of confidence I have in the way the government has approached this risk question is there's been this, this hyper focus on death. Mm -hmm. And okay, fine. That's part of the equation, but that's not going to affect everyone. Hopefully that's not going to affect most people, hopefully, but I really do think that there's a huge other spectrum of problems we're going to be dealing with for generations yeah. that will be the yeah. echo of this event. And we're not having those conversations in the policymaker circles. You know, there's zero evidence of that in all of the communication coming out of cabinet and the, uh, you know, chief mm -hmm. officers of health and so on. Um, worse still, they're removing all of the information I have 
uh, to be able to make an informed uh, decision about my own risk and my own yeah. risk tolerance, which is different than yours, you know, your yeah. family situation and everything else. And uh, unfortunately, coming back to some of that, that kind of engineering mentality, if I don't have those numbers, I need to take a very conservative approach. You know, I know before when you took the numbers away and it was bad and trending worse. So I have to assume we're much, much worse now, regardless of whatever the truth may or may not be. Mm -hmm. And and that has a huge impact both on, you know, my family, but also arguably all of my skill set. I'm also now prevented from being able to use that in the communities and help with that. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm already kind of uh, handcuffed a little bit and I'm able to do that a little bit, but not really fully engaged because these systems are not providing that kind of risk mitigation for my children. And yeah. I've lost trust. Yes. So I think that's in that gap analysis, my end rant. Oh, listen, that I was with you with with the rant, because what I'm hearing and what I'm feeling, right, if I separate it out as a mama um, and also as the uh, an elected official in town, um, what I'm hearing is that uh, folks are very, very, very nervous that the approach this government has decided to take at this point in the pandemic is to remove information and call it empowerment. Um, and yeah. I don't understand that. Like that, I am not empowered if I'm making decisions based on no information. I'm literally just taking guesses. I'm playing Wordle. They're playing Wordle with What's my their life, lives. Right? Oh, no, it helps. Like, Five letters, right? Yes, please. <laughs> so it that is, in my opinion, not cool. Um, the no, other thing, absolutely. the other thing that I think is really important to point out, um, and this was not like this was not designed; it just sort of happened. Um, but between Andrew, Nicole, and Jen, there are layers of expertise that I think the government forgets. Like they forget that parents are not separate from their professional spaces or their career spaces or whatever it is that they do during the day when their kitties are at school, right? And this government refuses to talk to people. So by refusing to talk to parents, to solicit um, some, some commentary and advice from parents, they're missing an opportunity to hear about the impact of ventilation on uh, academic success, which is literally what Andrew just taught them, um, or to hear about you know, what's happening uh, in daycares and the importance of, of holding that in order to hold the rest of the system, or the importance of knowing um, what's happening in high school is different than what's happening um, in, in J, uh, JK and all the way to uh, grade six, seven, eight, right? But they don't wanna talk to people. They don't even wanna talk to me. I really try and talk to them, but they don't, they don't respond. Anyway, um, the point is this. I'm going to move us into the second question. I'm going to collapse the second and third question because I think the way that this conversation is going, we can do it. Um, typically, I would ask folks to tell me what would leadership look like? And I think we've naturally moved into that space. Um, like all good parents, or I'll speak for myself, as a parent, first I rant, then I rave, and then I start to problem solve. But first I have to let out the, the rage about what is happening to me or the systems that are not functioning. Um, and so I want us to move into this problem solving space. What, what would leadership look like to address the kinds of concerns that you folks have raised? What is it that we need to see the government do in the, over the weekend? Because the reality is that they've changed their mind about things in the past. Um, and on as a backdrop to that question, I want to be really clear to anybody who's watching. Everybody wants their kids in school. Like it's not a matter of not wanting their, the schools to be open, but what they also want is the schools to be safe. When I put on my anti-racism critic hat, there is no racialized parent in Ontario that has said to me, I don't want my kid in school. What they have said is because of the impact of racism on my child, it is not safe for my child to be at school. Help me fix that system. And now with the pandemic, I would argue it's the same thing. Everybody wants the kids in school, but they've got questions about safety. And now with this notion of not reporting out, so we don't even know what's happening in there, we're worried. 
the other layer before I hand it over to you folks to answer leadership, what it would look like and imagining what that school system could be on Monday is this. That um, additional layer of support that folks are going to need that Andrew is pointing to reminds me about the fight that we've had um, to take seriously the need for investments in mental health. Like we needed mental health investments before the pandemic. The level of anxiety, stress and concern and fear that our young students are experiencing right now, that their parents are experiencing right now, that the educational workers are experiencing right now is going to rely or, uh, require a trauma-informed approach to policy making and investments from government. That's my own opinion, but I'm sticking to it. Um, so I'm going to hand. I'm going to change the order. Um, I am going to actually start with Jen and ask you about the leadership piece. Um, what is it that we need to see from government right now in order to feel like um, these concerns are being addressed? And what would it look like if you had that kind of leadership uh, from the the government right now? Well, <clears throat> I think. I you know, I, I think it's it's really unfortunate that the last two weeks seem to have been wasted. They had two weeks to try to put some safety mechanisms into place to 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 make things safe as of this coming Monday. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to have happened. And so it's, you know, from my perspective, it's almost as though they need a, a restart and to try that, try that one more time um, to, to be able to get the schools to a place. I mean, first of all, we're, we're at a point in terms of numbers. I mean, I guess we don't really know in terms of numbers, but certainly the fact that our hospital systems are completely overwhelmed would suggest to me that the numbers are pretty terrible. Um, and so thinking about, okay, well, when is a point that, you know, we, you know, or how, how can we collect data in a way that allows us to make an informed decision as to when it is safe for us to have these large congregate settings coming back together without without causing the kind of you know high rates of infection and potential future disability is that that Andrew mentioned you know so so actually looking carefully at the data collecting collecting data using evidence informed decision making to inform how we are going to proceed with the health and safety of our children teachers the community as a whole, because ultimately, you know, we do know that that this virus spreads rapidly in schools, and that affects the whole community and the health mm -hmm. of the whole community. Um, and so, you know, I think as you know, as a scientist, um, wanting this government to actually be listening to experts in the field, listening to their advice, and using data to guide their decisions. Um, I, I think that's what leadership would look like to yeah. me and that that means a number of steps and that's been outlined by people repeatedly in terms of the kinds of safety measures that have to be put into place in schools in terms of requiring this these these vaccines to be mandatory for a much you know wider set of things that we want to do um uh, whether it's schools or whether it's you know going shopping um yeah. so I think the information is there. I think the experts are telling us exactly what we need to do. And I think our government is not listening to that. And so I think leadership is listening to experts using informed decision making, using, you know, evidence informed decision making to guide what, what how we're going to proceed and to make sure that we're all as safe as we can be during this difficult time. Thank you so much for that, Jen. I am so lucky to have scientists in my neighborhood. What? Imagine if people listen to them. Just gonna leave it there for a moment. Everybody just take a deep breath with that thought. Yeah, don't even get me talking about climate change. <laughs> <laughs> listen, that's gonna be an upcoming podcast. Just just wait. You'll be back. Everybody, just take a look at Jen. She's coming back. Um, I have to say, uh, yes, that is, I totally agree. That is such an important point that you were making about what leadership looks like, um, what it needs to look like in order to get us uh, get us into a better place to be able to all make informed decisions. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Nicole to also offer some some thoughts on that as well. Like, what does leadership look like? What would it look like to make you feel confident um, for Monday or the time to come? Yeah, I think, Laura, may you kind of 
already sort of said, like, I feel like, of course, coming from a social work perspective is listening to people, right? Listening to parents, listening about what their struggles are. Like my struggle will be that, sure, in some ways, having it set that it's online, I know it, I can plan ahead. My worry is we're going to get to school. My kids are going to be off every five days. Like, I'm not even joking. My kids last year got tested for, had PCR tests six times each. So that's, if I were off, if I was off for five days, as well as the children, and then also thinking of all the educators, like mm -hmm. for five days, that would be a hundred and uh, like my 60 days, I think, e like for each kid. So 120 days, I think that I would be off and trying, and I don't have anyone to look after my kids because I won't know if I have COVID or not. Yeah. I won't know if my kids have COVID or not. So it's not like, you know, before where, or like at least now I can rely, I have a plan. I'm trying to stay safe. Now we're also isolated. We can't see anyone. We can't see my mom. I probably won't see her very much. Like just knowing that everything's going to be like, there's no monitoring. I won't know yep. anything. So I think listening to the, the parents and kind of, as well as the educators and just really understanding like what is day to day going to look like? And same thing in high school, right? Like what is the day to day? How can we kind of mitigate these risks? So having five days where I'm off every single time, as well as both my children with no schooling, and I imagine for the older kids, it will be much harder to be out of school for five days and not catching up. And like, why are we not allowing PCR tests? Like at least give them take home PCR tests. Like that's what I don't understand. Why not allow for the system to at least have this in place for these children and the educators? is those take home PCR tests. Even if you can't stand in line for an hour and a half and try and get booking, I don't understand why they can't do that. Two rapid tests won't do anything. Like what's yeah. that gonna do? And I've heard it's only 50% accurate. So it, it, like, it's kind of like this Band-Aid thing that we're gonna empower you by giving you two rapid tests. What's like, seriously, that's not doing anything. So literally it's a free for all. There's no difference. You're going back, it's the same thing. Except for now it's even worse because now you don't have any tracking like I want tracking and PCR tests like we we really need to make that a priority thank you so much for that Nicole um I can tell you that it feels to me sometimes like the the government's decisions about what they're going to do today are based on things that we had asked them to do like um months ago and so there was a time when the only tests that we had access to were these rapid tests and there was a push from community to get those tests out to people and now we have access to other things and they're still behind the eight ball saying, hey, you know what, we'll give you some of these before they expire. <laughs> I have thoughts, but I'm going to wrap up everything with my thoughts. So I'm sending it over to you, Andrew. Leadership in this space, what would it look like? What do you need? Talk to us. Yeah, well, I need to condense my notes because I had them broken into <laughs> two naturally. But um, so, I mean, when I first think of, of, of really just 30,000 feet, what does leadership look like? It has to be trust. It has to be predictable. And then also one of the immediate knock-ons after that um, that helps bis build that trust and that predictability is you are legally obligated to create safe workplaces. Yeah. If you can't check all those boxes, get out. You're not a leader. And um, in this particular case, I, I, I think that, you know, that next step of functionally what leadership should be doing here is kind of identifying those needs and, and connecting those needs with the appropriate resources and putting that through some sort of prioritization because we have limited resources. Yeah. Um, that will always be the case. And I think that um, the other aspect to that too is that leadership needs to be looking at things on sort of these multiple time horizons. There are short-term crises that we have to deal with right now. You know, yep. that very much in my mind includes uh, substantial, meaningful investment in addressing the improvement of ventilation in all public spaces, not just schools. And you could even argue all indoor spaces in general, because there's a lot that we could and should be doing in individual residences as well. Um, but the interesting thing is there, there's some intersection between ventilation as being a problem to solve our COVID troubles, but also that connects very much into the whole, and I'm sorry, Jen, I'm bringing you know, global warming into this and all of the climate change and everything else, because when we look at um, what we need to do in the country to actually achieve, you know, sort of net zero by 2030 or 2050 or pick whatever number, um, but a huge portion of that is directly connected to the heating of indoor spaces. 
Um, you know, if you address that and you address transportation, um, then what you're left with is a lot of more industrial processes and things like that. But arguably, those are things that are more into the private sector that we can encourage and facilitate that change. But the ownership from government and that that central position needs to have an incredible focus on ensuring transportation and heating systems um, are, are uh, high priorities in, in helping people to kind of decarbonize their lives. So we're solving that kind of 2030, 2050 vision problem and also addressing the short term immediate, we don't want to hurt kids. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that there is uh, a lot of important conversation that needs to happen on all of those types of time horizons, because if we fix one of them, if we are strategic about this, if we're yeah. smart about it, if we don't want to spend 10 times more than we have to, we could start to solve all of these problems together. But we can't do that without data. We can't do that yeah. without information. And, and that's where... Um, to connect into kind of the third question that you have on, you know, what do we do with it? You know, what are those solutions? Um, I want to to really elevate the idea of indoor air quality monitoring. And, and first and foremost, in the conversation of COVID, everyone talks about this as, uh, as carbon, mono or carbon dioxide sensors. Hopefully you also have carbon monoxide sensors in your uh, world as well, but that's, that's a separate issue. Um, but those carbon dioxide sensors, provide a sort of surrogate measurement to how much uh, activity is in that space, both in terms of occupancy. Do we have 30 kids at rest or do we have 30 kids running around like crazy? Mm -hmm. um, because there's, there's different demands put on that ventilation system as a result. But it's not just a carbon dioxide sensor. There's other important things too. You also want to get temperature in there. You want to get some relative humidity. You want to get uh, some barometric pressure. That gives you all sorts of wonderful scientific information to wrap up this whole ventilation question. But when I get back to that earlier point of indoor air quality is the new asbestos uh, type of problem for society, um, then I think that what's going to quickly follow is when we talk about this uh, this PM 2.5 measurement, you know, looking at a particulate matter in this 2.5 micron size range. And, um, and that's a little bit less important and meaningful for COVID. But when we start to talk about this in a larger holistic, uh, having healthy indoor spaces to promote, you know, community health, better mm -hmm. education, less disease and death, uh, this is an important piece to that as well. Um, but I think that also it's extremely important to not just put those sensors in there and have the sign up on the wall saying, oh, look, you know, we're at uh, 3000 PPM CO2. Maybe we should open up a window. It's so much more important from that kind of that, that engineering scientist side of things to say, we need to track those numbers. We need yeah. to record them because there's an incredible number of things we can do with just a, a little bit of math to kind of understand you know, how is that system working? And, and very specifically, you can do some, some simple calculations and come up with essentially what is the clean air delivery rate to this space? How many air exchanges per hour are there? And, and some of the very early high quality guidance we have on that uh, coming from, I think it was the, 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 uh, one of the Harvard Institute schools that uh, was one of the first to, to jump on this. But you wanna have six uh, air exchanges per hour in a school environment. And, and this is new guidance. So, I mean, when people say, oh yeah, our ventilation system meets, you know, ASHRAE 62.1, well, there's a dozen different versions of that and it's changed dramatically in 20 years and it can meet that standard, but based on the year it was made and, and it's a totally different answer to what you get if you built that building today. Um, but regardless, uh, what this real-time kind of monitoring also provides is confidence that that ventilation system is working today. Yeah. Not six months ago when you had, uh, you know, your, your maintenance staff come through and change some filters and, and do a little bit of a tune up, but it gives you confidence it's working right now. And we need to have kind of these feedback loops of, you know, let's do a little bit of periodic analysis. Let's understand, first of all, where are we? You know, because I can almost guarantee you there's not going to be a single school. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to be bold in this statement and, and, and let somebody prove me I'm wrong. I don't think there's a single public school uh, classroom in, uh, in, in our region, let's say, uh, that meets that six air exchanges an hour target today. Mm -hmm. um, 
you can get two or three of those with fresh air. And then you can also do some other things like top it up with a little bit of supplementary filtration in that space, be it a, a HEPA unit or, you know, a Corsi Rothenthal uh, uh, DIY box. But you add those two together to get that six. That is the exact number that, to my understanding, based on some news articles that the University of Toronto jumped into, you know, and this yeah. was be it a year ago, and they've already achieved this. And, and I'd like to at least be able to tell my children that the classroom they're going to is just as safe as the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And it's perhaps even more important that their classroom is at least as safe, if not more, because my kids aren't vaccinated. Everybody yeah. at U of T is vaccinated. And, and that's, that's mandatory, if I recall now. There's no, I don't think there's any exemption for doing tests or, you know, whatever, even if you could get rapid tests or PCRs. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So how do I explain that to my kid five, 10 years from now, if they are a long COVID survivor, or maybe they've, they've experienced the death of a, of a peer in, in that classroom, you know, to say, well, U of T had money, they had donors, sorry, yeah. oops. This is not the moment in time to, um, to come up short. Yeah. And, and, and our children deserve this and more, but honestly, CO2 sensors in classrooms and, and doing sort of a, an independent engineering supported study of where are we, what do we need to do with respect to these thresholds, tying that into this whole climate change kind of, of framework of this school was wonderful and great. And, you know, I can think of the ones couple I went to as a kid in this community. They were fine then, but they're no longer really likely going to survive. It's not worth fixing them. We need to replace them with new. And that's going to be true for some of them. But we need the plan today so that we can fund it tomorrow, so that we can build it next year, so that, you know, we can get ourselves out of this. Because, you know, another part to this, too, is this is not the last pandemic. It's been 100 years uh, since the last oh, yeah. one. And, and all, the, all the science that's been provided since seems to suggest that, you know, be it higher populations and, you know, lifestyle and everything else, I don't think we're going to wait another 20 years before the next one. And I think worst case, we do all of this wonderful preparations, we get all of these other tangential benefits. And, you know, there's, there's not a single uh, reputable source or peer reviewed journal article that's going to say lower CO2 in a classroom is actually worse outcome uh, mm -hmm. for students. In a worst case scenario, we've done something and we've actually employed people and created work at a time we really need to do that anyway. So thank you so much, Andrew, for that. Um, I think uh, as we wrap up uh, today's edition of, of People in My Hood, we're left with some pretty important tidbits of info. Um, we are very, very clear on the fact that as parents, we require information in order to make better decisions. Um, and we're also very, very clear that the investments that we are fighting for right now are the ones that are going to keep us safe in the future. Um, and if we don't start investing in some of these social systems, then we're going to be in what I like to professionally call a hot mess the next time some kind of a, a global emergency comes our way. Um, and those investments include things like investing in uh, support for people with disabilities. Because as we talk about not knowing what the long-term impact is going to be, um, of having COVID, we can't have that conversation without recognizing that folks with disabilities were already struggling because these systems were being undermined and underinvested in um, that should have been helping to make sure that they were safe, secure, and loved. Um, and so with that, I say this. Thank you to everybody for joining me today. Thank you for watching if you're watching on the replays. Thank you for being here live. Um, thank you for fighting, for making your voices heard. Thank you to the parents like you folks, Andrew, Nicole, and Jen, for coming and joining me. Um, and let's just keep putting the pressure on. I'm sure that there'll be lots of information coming to us over the weekend, um, and we'll see what happens on Monday. But here you are, another edition of People in My Hood, a philosophical podcast. Bye for now, and stay safe. Bye. Thank you.